testing. Oh, you know what I need to do? It's on. I had to turn another button on. I had to turn on another button. Almost forgot that button. I have no doubt. I have no doubt. All right. All right. Thanks. Well, good afternoon. It is after 3 o'clock, so I want to honor your time with those who are here. Um, we did make a mention earlier that, that the outsides may be a little tough to see the screen, but Dr. Carey assured us it won't affect what he has to talk about. So uh, we are live streaming this as well. If you go on St. Peter's website, there is also will be the recording if you want to watch it again. Unfortunately, the recording will not have this on because it's kind of a wide pan recording. Um, but if you want to watch it again and, and just kind of digest what you heard today, that's available for you. Also, bathrooms, if you go out to the, to the straight out and to the right, across from the bulletin boards in the nursery, there are restrooms, there's water fountains there if you need them as well. Um, and I just want to personally thank um, Lancaster Interfaith Peace Witness for hosting their um, speaker here today, and I want to give a great thanks to Dr. Carey. He was one of my seminary professors. I liked him so much, not only did I get my master's at Lancaster Seminary, I got my doctorate there too. So just putting a plug in for good old Lancaster Seminary. So I'm going to call forward um, Sandy Strauss. Good afternoon. I'm Sandy Strauss, as she said. Um, I'm Director of Advocacy and Ecumenical Outreach for the Pennsylvania Council of Churches, but also a board member of Lancaster Inner Church Peace Witness. And I'm really thrilled to see so many of you here today for this uh, topic that is certainly on a lot of people's minds and has been coming up more and more in the media. Uh, before I introduce Dr. Carey, I wanted to mention some of you got cards as you came in, uh, note cards that you can use to put questions on to hand in so we can ask those questions during the Q&A period following the talk. But there, we have so many people, we didn't have quite enough cards. So if you can share a card or if you didn't get one and don't have someone to share with it, if you can put something on a scrap of paper and hand it in, that would be great. So anyway, without, um, oh, and I do want to make one other announcement, and I'll mention it again later if, if, um, if you all don't remember. Um, we are going to be doing another program on this topic in Harrisburg on October 6th, and it will be, um, it's called, um, it's called uh, Christianity in America, Sacred or Supremacist? 
And uh, our main speaker will be Dr. Robert Jones. He has written several books, but his most recent is called White Too Long, and he deals with this issue and white supremacy in the church and, and so on. So, and following it, we will have a panel discussion and Greg Carey will be our moderator for that discussion. So I hope that you all will be able to either attend uh, in Harrisburg or we will be streaming as well. So I'm both pleased and honored to introduce our speaker today, Dr. Greg Carey. Greg is a professor of New Testament at Lancaster Theological Seminary where he's been teaching since 1999. And he has authored or co-edited 10 books, including his most recent, Using Our Outside Voice, Public Biblical Interpretation. He's an ardent Twitterer. And um, if you're on Twitter, I would certainly recommend following him. He posts a lot of really good stuff. Um, Greg says that his it says in his bio that teaching and advising students is what provides his primary sense of vocation. And I can attest to the value of that. Um, I was one of Greg's students also in the early 2000s and uh, had several classes with him. And he was also my advisor. And I should also mention um, that he was the best advisor a student could have. Really, no, seriously, uh, a real champion for those who were his advisees. I should also mention that, as you might guess from the title of his most recent book, he seeks to help students to become better public interpreters of scripture, which is a valuable skill in this world where scripture gets twisted and used to justify all kinds of wrongdoing including the justification of the subject of this talk today, Christian nationalism. I could probably say much more, but I'm guessing you're looking forward to hearing what Greg has to say about this topic as much as I am. So without further ado, I present Dr. Greg Carey. Thanks so much. Good afternoon. I'm so used on Sundays to saying good morning. It's good to see all of you, all of you, wow. And it's been my experience. I've been alarmed about Christian nationalism for about 10 years at increasing levels and watching what was going on. And now that I see there's kind of a fire of interest because people are confronted so directly with this phenomenon. And yet there's also a lot of Confusion. Where does it come from what it is? So what I'll try to do is sort of define it, talk for a little bit about what it looks like, how you recognize what's up in those conversations, and then to provide a little bit of context, not as much as I'd like, but a little bit about how it got to be what it is. That's the part of the presentation a lot of people don't know. Finally, to talk about Christian nationalism and race. I almost never say Christian nationalism. I almost always say white Christian nationalism. And there are reasons for that. And then we can talk. I'd like to begin with a passage of scripture from Galatians, where Paul tells believers that they're called to freedom. Freedom is a big word for Christian nationalists. But I hate to put it this way, they don't mean by freedom what Jesus and Paul mean by freedom. And they don't mean by freedom what Moses and the prophets mean by freedom. Freedom, Paul says, not to use as an opportunity for self-indulgence, but through love to become enslaved to one another. For the whole law is summed up in a single commandment. Wonder where you got that idea. Actually, it was current in the Judaism of his day independent of Jesus. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. For followers of Jesus, freedom is freedom to love and serve. It is not freedom to dominate. And the word dominate is going to show up in this conversation. 
So what are sort of the core things that identify what Christian nationalism is? The first is Christian nationalists will tell you that the United States has a special relationship with God. That God was involved in the founding of the United States, that God particularly blesses the United States of all the nations in the world, and, and that God has a mission for the United States within world history. So that's first. Second, the United States should say so. We should declare ourselves a Christian nation and show that in our symbolism and our public rituals and all of that. And then third, that we should pass laws and promote policies that are quote-unquote Christian. And this is where it gets really important because for years the media has been confused and thought the loudest Christians spoke for all the Christians, right? So you would turn on TV, who was speaking for Christianity? Members of the white religious right, almost always. One of the things we'll come back to that Robert Jones in uh, White Too Long has documented so well, assigned reading at Lancaster in one of my classes, um, one of the things he's documented so well is white Christians, when it comes to matters of public affairs, when we're polled about our opinions, are farther away from black Christians than any other group. All of us, whatever white kind of Christianity we say we are, mainline, Catholic, evangelical, are way too far. Evangelical at the farthest. But that is one of, one of the issues. White Christian nationalists don't speak for all Christians. They speak for a stream of Christianity that's not small, but not representative either. And so if you imagine it this way, who would get to pray at the high school graduation if it were up to them? Wouldn't be Dottie Almoni or Sandy Strauss. They're women. Wouldn't be a rabbi. So that's what I mean by representing a stream um, rather than the whole. This is what it looks like. For this is the only slide I hoped people would see. It, it's the picture of Donald Trump in front of St. Thomas Episcopal, St. John's Episcopal Church in Washington during the 2020 George Floyd Black Lives Matter protest in Washington. He used military and police force to clear the crowd out of the way, right? Walks to a church that didn't invite him and complained that he'd been there. Holds up a Bible. Well, nobody holds a Bible like that ever. If anybody who's ever read a, Bi read a Bible has never held it like that. But, I mean, to be really serious, it wasn't his Bible. It was Ivanka's. He didn't have one in the White House. And when asked his favorite verse, best he could do is, I like them all. <laughs> I don't like them all. Uh, thank you for laughing. It's meant to be funny. But, but, he's fusing white power with that image. He is trying to suppress activism for black justice in policing and the criminal justice system. And he's using the Bible and using the church to claim that position. That, friends, is white Christian nationalism. That's what it means. It is about domination. And domination for a particular group of people within the society. So the first problem that I have with white Christian nationalism is domination. And we'll talk about the language of domination that they use. And the second problem, for Christians, for followers of Jesus, nationalism of any kind is idolatry. Right? Uh, so that's a problem too. But for me, the first problem 
is the effort to dominate, to use Christianity as leverage for power. I was on Twitter, <laughs> busted, and I came across this image, obviously a couple of years ago, uh, a COVID image. So on top are sheep wearing masks, and on the bottom are lions on the prowl, what the church should look like. We should be lions on the prowl, but Christians shouldn't be. What did Jesus call his followers? <laughs> Sheep. And as a scholar who spends a lot of time on the book of Revelation, I couldn't help but to think of an image in Revelation chapter 5 where Jesus is revealed in the heavenly throne room. And he hears a voice that says, Look, the lion of Judah has con conquered and can open the scroll and its seals. So he thinks he's going to see a lion. Then I saw between the throne and the living creature, four living creatures standing a lamb, standing as if it had been slain. This in Revelation is an interpretation of how Jesus' power is active in the world. I want to tell you something. The lion never shows up in Revelation. It is all lamb all the time. I'm talking about the ways in which Christian nationalism is a danger to Christianity itself because of its perverted understanding of power, a certain kind of masculine militaristic power, and its perverted understanding of freedom. I don't know if you've kept much touch with Michael Flynn, who was director of the National Intelligence Agency under Donald Trump, retired three-star general, uh, but he recently just said it. If we're going to have one nation under God, which we must, we have to have one religion. One nation under God and one religion under God. I have so many slides of people saying this kind of stuff that I can't use in the amount of time uh, talking about what white Christian nationalism will do. I mean, they're, they're not hiding it anymore. They have hidden it. They're not hiding it anymore. The Pope recently in Canada spoke out against governments driven even by Christianity. And I thought, isn't it remarkable? Isn't it remarkable that the Pope sees what's happening in the United States, what's happening in Russia, what's happening in Hungary, and feels the need to speak about it because this is an international thing. Um, a friend of mine, Lancaster alum Sharon Jacob, who's teaching New Testament at the Claremont School of Theology now, Sharon has pointed out that Hindu nationalism in India is working the same way. And so we're hoping to build some sort of project out of thinking about that. I mean, we're not the youngest crowd I've ever seen. <laughs> but that means that we're all used to a certain measure of sort of Christian stuff woven into our civil culture. We, most of us, grew up hearing prayers at public events, government events. All of our presidents have had to say that what church they were a member of, and they finished their speeches with God Bless America, and we know that legislatures have chaplains and, and all of that stuff. We're, we're used to civil religion in that way. And some of us may have been uncomfortable with it. I was the kid in high school, you can look at me and maybe tell, who was asked to say the prayer at graduation. And I wasn't comfortable with it. But I did it, because you just did. And now I look back and think, I wish I'd said something, you know, but I didn't have that capacity then. But what about the claim that you'll hear, and how do we prepare ourselves to answer it? Well, America was founded as a Christian nation. Now, very close by, a terrific nationally known historian named John Fea teaches at Messiah University. 
And John is a conservative evangelical. And he is white. And he wrote a book, Was America Founded as a Christian Nation? And what John demonstrates in this book is it's complicated. Where do you mean? Right? Do you mean Massachusetts? If you mean Massachusetts, they meant to start a Christian thing. Right? That's why we got Rhode Island, because people had to run away from that thing uh, to get religious freedom. Right? Baptist. What about Maryland? Pretty Catholic. What about Virginia? Well, they were all Christians. They'd all been baptized. They were from England, the white ones, right? Uh, they weren't there to do a Christian thing. They were there to make money. It varied from colony to colony and the ways they dealt with And Pennsylvania, of course, complicated, complicated, uh, meant to be inclusive for everybody with some preference, right? So... That argument that the America was founded a certain way, though, is often promoted by quote-unquote historians who have no academic credentials and no ethics. Okay. Um, and that's why John Fea took the time to write this book, because that nuance of a country that's always been complicated when it comes to religion is hard to communicate in a CNN, MSNBC, Fox News kind of way, right? It just doesn't make for a 30-second thing. But it's an essential thing to know. If somebody says it was founded as a Christian nation, say, well, tell me more about Maryland. Tell me more about Rhode Island. Right. However, in the 20th century, a group began to form who identified themselves as Christian Reconstructionists. This is R.J. Rushdooney. He died about 20 years ago. Uh, he was Presbyterian, and he had studied a lot of Dutch theology, and he argued Christians should, here's your word, have dominion over society. He argued that biblical laws should function as civil laws, all of them. Executions for sexual offenders of whatever category the Bible wanted to define at a particular time, right? All of them. Punishments for idolatry, however that would be defined. And he, this is key for us in Pennsylvania in 2022. He considered public education to be godless indoctrination. Isn't that interesting? We hear that, right? His influence has really continued. There are many streams that go into Christian nationalism, but his is one that's important to know. He's incredibly important for the movement of founding um, Christian homeschooling. And if you ever get a chance to look at the homeschooling curriculum, right, it is all the way through white Christian nationalism. So, and that's what's going on in our Christian academies in Lancaster County, too. If you ask people what it was like, they, they will tell you what kind of education they got, for example, in history. But I also think it may be helpful for a group like this one to be aware that over the past 15 or 20 years, there really are two streams of Christian nationalists who work together but if they weren't working together on that, they would hate each other. Okay. So you, we all remember Jerry Falwell, right? Baptist, tie, gray suit, you know, orderly, kind of dogmatic, theologically. Around Donald Trump over the past seven years, the Jerry Falwell figure would be Robert Jeffress, pastor of First Baptist Dallas. You hear him all the time. Um, sort of a similar character. That's one stream. But the other stream, how many of you recognize Paula White? See, I do need to be here. I, was, I, I told Sandy, I don't know. Don't know how much they know. So 
Paula White is out of the Pentecostal charismatic stream. She's white. She pastors a multiracial church in Florida. Prosperity gospel, right? Love God, be faithful, get money, get health, get satisfaction, get happy relationships. You've seen her, if you were watching the news, if you, if you know who her, she is, you've seen her like cast out demons who oppose Donald Trump, that stream. That's the group that got me alarmed 10 years ago. They came to Lancaster, and one of my best friends from home, I mean, all the way back to second grade, we also went to seminary. When I say we were close, he played quarterback, I played center, and we didn't run the shotgun. We were close. Okay? Said, hey, I'm coming to Lancaster. And I went, there were five, how does a seminary professor not know 5,000 people are coming to town for an event? And that was the first time I heard about the seven mountains of culture. And I'm just going to skip ahead to that. In that world, for a long time, they've been saying Christians need to take dominion over the seven mountains of culture. Business, government, family, religion, media, education, entertainment. When you listen to these preachers, and a church in Camp Hill is one of the most important ones in the country. When you listen to these preachers, they don't talk about the Bible much. Their authority is in the, their claims to have direct prophetic revelations from God. And then they say they're all in alignment with one another. So they all show up at the same conferences, which is a way of giving each other money, right? Um, they all repeat what each other says. This is where we got the stream of Donald Trump being not a Messiah, but a new Cyrus, a figure from the Bible who wasn't an Israelite, but helped the people of Judea move back to the land. And so, you know, you could have a pagan who does a good thing. And so that was a prophecy to one of these teachers. And it's remarkable. I'm always running into churches that are bigger than any church I regularly attend in Lancaster County that are that stream of Christianity. I want to come back to this one. This I have access to, I won't say how, the fundraising man magazine for Dayspring Christian Academy. And this was an issue last fall. They had Charlie Kirk, who is a... He was at Liberty University until Jerry Falwell Jr. got kind of caught in a couple of ways. And um, when you get their magazine, every, there's not a single issue that's about Jesus or loving your neighbor or looking out for hunger. It's always some culture war issue, right-wing culture. This was Restore Education, Restore America. I thought, okay, let's see. What, what, what were they worried about in the fall of 2021 in education. Oh, got to get rid of critical race theory. I guarantee you couldn't have found a public school principal in Lancaster County who could define <laughs> critical race theory. I've been using it for years in my own scholarship. I can define it. You never see it defined by someone who's attacking it. They just say whatever they want to say that makes it look to, oh, it makes white people feel guilty. That's what they wanted to talk about in their Christian school publication. In Elizabethtown, members of one congregation have three of the nine seats on the school board and are trying to get to five. They've been getting... Elizabethtown is a pretty Republican area, right? Um, and I don't like talking partisan politics in a church space. Um... So it's a conservative school board, but these three want to eliminate the teaching of science, for example, since it doesn't run so well with their outlook. And they haven't been winning their votes. So in a sermon at this church, we on the school board have noticed something. There's a demonic warfare going on in the school board. That's that stream of Christianity. The enemy comes over that board. They mean the devil. 
and we're constantly losing conservative votes five to four, right? That's the outlook, right? Our point of view is God's. Any other point of view is satanic, demonic. There's no compromise. There's no collaboration. So. So I'm going to move to start doing the analysis. I, I was trying to sort of introduce the movement. What's it like? What does it look like? Two books that have been, um, I've been reading a lot, and if anybody wants, I can, not here, but I can send you a bibliography. Um, my email is gcarey, C-A-R-E-Y, that simple, at lancasterseminary.edu, and I'll, I'll send you a bibliography if you're that nerdy. But, <laughs> Yeah. Obrey Hendricks, an African-American New Testament scholar who's been a seminary professor since retired, wrote a book called Christians Against Christianity, arguing, trying to lay out a biblical case for why Christian nationalism is anti-biblical. Two sociologists I stay in touch with, Andrew Whitehead and Samuel Perry, tried to define the movement sociologically in a book called Taking America Back for God. What I want to say is, I never describe this movement as not Christian. All the evil that's in this movement has always been somewhere in Christianity. Right? The drive to dominate, the drive to define and exclude, the drive to enslave. We've always been capable of it. So I'm not going to say who's Christian or who's not. I want to say it's dangerous for Christianity and it's dangerous for democracy. Not all Christianity is healthy, right? Now, Robert Jones, I mentioned, Sandy mentioned, white too long, makes the point, one of the most remarkable consistent findings in contemporary public opinion data is a chasm between two groups who otherwise share both geographic proximity and a common religious or theological orientation. If you ask most black Protestants and most white evangelicals what they believe about a bunch of theological issues, they will agree. If you ask them what they think about capital punishment, police brutality, education, opportunity, poverty, they won't. And so we're going to try to sort of unpack what some of that is. For example, on these two graphs, if you're looking, the little white bar is white evangelicals. And the question is, are people poor mostly because they're lazy and shiftless? White evangelicals. That's it! Are people poor because the society is structured in certain ways? White evangelicals. Oh, no. Right? more than any other group in the society. Now look, I think we all have encountered poverty where people weren't doing their end of things. That needs to be worked on. I think we've all also encountered poverty as a structural feature of our society. And just pointing out what that gap looks like right there, um, if you're looking at the screen even up close, you can't, unfortunately can't see black Protestants because they're represented in black. But it's the opposite, right, of white evangelicals. Or when soci sociologists ask questions, people questions that identify what racist bias on their part. White evangelicals always come out number one. White Catholics, number two. White mainline Protestants, number three. The general population, not as, it is a scandal to the church. The more people, white people go to church, the worse we get in terms of our racial attitudes. I'm not, that was not meant to be funny. That's what a sociologist will tell you when they look at this data. Perry wrote a book with a historian named Philip Gorski. White Christian, and this is polling data, sincerely believe that whites and Christians are the most persecuted groups in America. 
And if you watch right-wing media, that is the message every night. Every night. If you watch it for 15 minutes, you can't... You, have you noticed that you have that, those relatives who are always angry? The white relative who watches that media? They're angry because you can't watch it and not be angry. So... Are you a Christian nationalist? How would they know? They look at surveys that ask people like 100 questions, but six are hidden in there. Do you think the federal government should declare the United States a Christian nation? Do you think the net federal government should advocate Christian values? The third one stands out, it's different. Do you think the federal government should enforce strict separation of church and state? That's a way, if someone says yes to that, they're not likely to be a Christian. The others are, they are. Should allow the display of religious symbols in public pace, places. The success of the United States is part of God's plan. The federal government should allow prayer in public schools. Right? And what they've concluded from all these survey questions, Whitehead and Perry, is that Christian nationalism often influences Americans' opinions and behaviors in the opposite direction that traditional markers of religious per participation or commitment would promote. In other words, you can separate Christian nationalism from Christianity by looking at polling data. And as I've suggested earlier, one of the primary things you identify is the question of race. So I'm going to run fast for a moment. These are things, according to Whitehead and Perry, that Christian nationalists are more likely to think than the rest of folk. They're more likely to approve of authoritarian, authoritarian tactics, like demanding that people show respect for national symbols and traditions. National anthem, flag. They're more likely than other Americans to fear and distrust religious minorities, including Muslims, atheists, and Jewish people. They're more likely to condone police violence toward black Americans and distrust accounts of racial injustice in the criminal justice system. Um, in fact, they're more likely to say, in response to a survey question, the reason that black Americans experience police violence is they're more violent themselves. They're more likely to believe racial inequality is due to the personal shortcomings of minority groups. More likely to report they're very uncomfortable with interracial marriage and transracial adoption. More likely to hold anti-immigrant views. More likely to fear refugees. More likely to oppose scientists and science education in schools. Been through that in Pennsylvania. More likely to believe men are better suited for all leadership roles while women are better suited to care for children in the home. Apparently, they didn't read the studies that show if you go to the hospital, you should hope your doctor is a woman. <laughs> I'm headed home. But it takes a minute. I want to talk about authoritarianism and democracy in the context of... Because the reason you're here is you've picked up on white Christian nationalism being a threat to democracy. And how does that work? Um, Evan Stewart at the University of Minnesota has found that people who are high in, he says P-R-E, public religious expression, like, do I have a Jesus sticker on my car? I don't, by the way, I'm so afraid if I cut somebody off, they'll just, they'll write off, I knew they were all like that, right? So I, I just don't. But they're more likely to express intolerance toward other groups, toward groups they dislike. The more Jesus they show you, the less tolerant they are of people who differ from them. Here's the one you need to know in Pennsylvania. 
In your whole life, how many of you have ever heard someone say, I think voting is a privilege, not a right? All my life, I've heard voting is a right. I've heard some of you say, yeah, I have heard it. White Christ this is the chart of their 24 points of Christian nationalism. To the left is disagreeing with voting as a privilege. To the right, the stronger you affirm Christian nationalist values, the more you think voting is a privilege and not a right. In other words, if you were to say to someone, it's not democratic to require people to jump through all these hoops to vote. It's not democratic to shut down polling places in black neighborhoods. It's not democratic, you know, and just to go on with those questions, they would look at you confused. It wouldn't be persuasive to them at all because they really believe you can pick and choose. And I told you, I don't like being partisan, but Doug Mastriano, who is our Republican candidate for governor, has said if he's elected, he will strip the voter rolls and start over. They're also more likely, when they're wrong about something, to be sure they're right. That's what this chart is. And I can't tell you how many of those conversations I've had. Now, I have to admit, I'm the same way, and I'm not a Christian nationalism Christian nationalist, but that, that is a thing too because I was just preaching at a church this morning where a lot of people had grown up in that sort of Christian environment and they, they shared with me that they had never heard before today that the Bible has much to say about poverty. I said, well, look, these people are in recovery. No, no, they are. It is a wonderful, sweet congregation. I'm just telling you it was news to them, right? Because in that world, they restrict information. If you're not loyal to that worldview, you teach in a public school, you, you're a professor, uh, you're a biblical scholar, you're a scientist, you're not to be listened to, not to be trusted. So they really are more sure they're right because it's what they've heard about democracy. Whitehead and Perry. Um, it appears to be unmoored from the traditional Christian ideals and morality, also inclined toward authoritarian figures. One of the things I noticed in my Southern Baptist life was, growing, if you grow up Baptist in white Baptist churches, the pastor is just there. Right? The church is run by lay people. And all of a sudden in Southern Baptist life, people started talking about obeying the pastor, obeying the pastor, obeying. And I thought, where did this come from? And, huh, Justice Department just announced an investigation of the Southern Baptist Convention for how it's been handling sexual abuse cases. This is a Mastriano rally. They often begin with a Messianic Jew, a Jew who is Christian, blowing the shofar, uh, the horn of battle or assembly in Judaism at the beginning of the meeting. There's not a stronger Christian nationalist symbol than this. I was just at a meeting where, where somebody said, you know, we're going to have this interreligious service, and a rabbi said, you know, we could blow a shofar. I was like, you don't know what it means to these people. It means holy war. Right? Franklin Graham, son of Billy. Tremendous fascination with Russia and Hungary among white Christian nationalists because Vladimir Putin and Viktor Orban are defining their nations as defending traditional Christianity. Lance Wellnow, one of, one of the big preacher, radio, media people in that movement, um, said, it's hard to make Putin the villain if you have all the facts. He said Hillary Clinton and the CIA tried to undercut, undercut Russia by injecting LGBTQ doctrine into Russia until Putin, quote, clamped down like a good dictator does. 
Republican candidate for Senate in Delaware in 2020 uh, said, I identify more with Putin's Christian values than I do with Joe Biden. After the election, correspondence between Mark Meadows, chief of staff to Donald Trump, Jenny Thomas, spouse of Supreme Court Justice Clarence Thomas, it's a fight of good versus evil. Evil always looks like the victor until the king of king triumphs, dominion. Uh, do not grow weary in well-doing. The fight continues. I've staked my career on it, or at least my time in D.C. on it. One country in Europe has been really wish-washy about whether it will support Ukraine against Russia's invasion. And I don't know if you know there's a Christian dimension to that war. Uh, the Ukrainian church declared independence from the Russian church a few years ago, and that independence was recognized by the other Orthodox churches, but not by the Russian church. And the Russian archbishop, on those grounds and other grounds, blesses the war. Orban and Putin. Back in April, CPAC, the Conservative Political Action Con Conference for the United States, one of the crucial institutions of the far right in the United States, chose to have its meeting for the first time not in the United States, but in Hungary. And Orban, later this year, had this to say about Europeans and race. It's why we've always fought. We're willing in Europe to mix with one another. We do not want to become peoples of mixed race. Talking about immigration from Africa and the Middle East into Hungary. July 23rd, on August 4th, he was in Texas speaking at CPAC, receiving a standing ovation. And he said, don't worry, a Christian politician cannot be racist. I know I'm not supposed to, like, look in the eyes of individual black people in the room to see if they would agree with that. I just, things you know without asking, right? So we should never hesitate to heavily challenge our opponents on these issues. Be sure Christian values protect us from going too far. Week and a half after he said, we, we don't want to be mixed race. And one of his cabinet ministers resigned and said, that was a Nazi speech. We have it in Lancaster County. And it's starting to show up in the newspaper, which may be how some of you got alarmed, um, is seeing that there are these meetings happening in breweries and restaurants and, you know, a movie in a theater and all that. We have a candidate for governor who says, God's really working on our state in November. Listen to this language. We're going to take our state back. Who's we? Who are we taking it back from? What happens to the people you take it back from? Are they citizens or not? Um, so I have something to tell you that's not in my bio. I'm a graduate of the Southern Baptist Theological Seminary. <laughs> Some of you know it used to be a good school. And it was taken over by fundamentalists as the Southern Baptist Convention changed. And Al Mohler became the president the year after I graduated. I was president of the pitiful little Whitsitt Society for Baptist Freedom Resistance Movement. <laughs> anyway, the president of Southern Seminary is still the president of Southern Seminary all these 30 years later. Right after the January 6th insurrection, he was courageous enough to say, Nationalism is always a clear and present danger. In June, he said, we have the left routinely speaking of me and others as Christian nationalists as if we're supposed to be running from that. Yeah, you said that last year, right? I'm not about to run from that. This is my final point in this way. One of the problems we're having is that extremism always amplifies itself. When someone says or does something extreme, then there's a race to go farther than that. 
you, you don't get a media following. You don't get Twitter followers. You don't get exposure in the media if you don't go farther than the last one. And that's what we're experiencing here in the United States. So think about, and I'm not here to stake out a policy position or even an ethical position on abortion, which is a tough issue. Most Americans are uncomfortable with abortion sometimes, but want women to have a, a chance to make a choice, right? And that's pretty much true in all the states. But watch how fast legislatures, legislatures are coming up with more and more and more, right? All the way to birth control being illegal. So it's, it's not a matter of me telling you what I think you should think about the issue. It's a matter of noticing what happens when a person like Al Mohler just gets carried away by the tide, right? Um, about a week ago, I thought I should read Animal Farm again. Oh, that's what happens in Animal Farm. So what, what do I recommend for you? This, this is not, everything I've said up to now is fairly, I'm not a primary research on Christian nationalism. I don't do that work. I read the people who do and talk about it. But um, this is just my opinion. I think you need to guard your soul. I mean that as sincerely as I can. Be prayerful. Be in community. Keep that soft, loving heart of yours soft and loving. Never give it away. Because you're going to have to show courage. It's hard to say, stay, protect your soul, and say, keep alert. Right? I wake up in the morning and immediately think, I wonder what's in the Twitter feed today right but we do have to stay alert we have to follow keep up with the news be discerning if you're a republican be courageous and resist christian nationalism in your party if you're a democrat you got to win when i say you got to win i mean public education in pennsylvania will be crippled for decades if Doug Mastriano is the governor. Women's right to their own health decisions. Right? Uh, the right of true freedom of religion. Investment in any public good. Parks, roads. If you're not an activist, you need to be an activist. I don't, it's knocking on doors, making phone calls. You got to win. And somehow, while you're that activated, you have to still love your neighbor as you love yourself and figure out to the degree that it's possible how to have loving conversations. That might be the hardest part. So I'm told there's a Q&A process in, in place that folks have cards. I'm told there weren't enough cards, but that if you had a question, should I let someone else facilitate? Sandy's up. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. I like to think I'm more informed than most, but I just learned a lot too, so thank you. Um, if you have a question, if you have a card, uh, we have a couple of people who will be collecting those cards, and we will ask the questions from up here. Are there any, are there any over here? Are you fielding them? Looks like you're going to get your steps in. <laughs> Thank you. Is that it? One more. Oh, 
Oh, here's one. Oh. Oh. Oh, wow. Okay. Let me take a quick look mm -hmm. through this. Actually, this, I, oh, that's more. Okay. I kind of doubt we're going to get all of these in, but we'll try. Okay, I'm going to start with this question. If the Christian worldview should not be the standard for righteousness in society, what should be? What is the highest standard? That, that is a legitimate great question, isn't it? So for those of us who are Christian, our allegiance is to Jesus, right? And it will shape our outlooks on what should be good policies. It will shape our outlooks on um, how we'll organize our lives and all that. The question is, then what do we do in a society where not everyone either is about Jesus or understands Jesus the same way? And there are issues, right, where there's no dodging that we might, because we're Christians, promote a particular point of view that other people reject and politically try to win. That happens. That's different than trying to dominate the society and give Christianity the, the power of government over everyone else. And that's what I'm interested in resisting. Christian nationalists will never acknowledge that Christians disagree with each other about important things, right? You either submit or you don't. And so that, that's the distinction I'm trying to make. I'm not trying to say we shouldn't go to Jesus first. But I also want to say, say this, and I might get in trouble. I'll put it as a question to you. Did you need the Bible to learn not to steal? Do you need the Bible to know you shouldn't commit adultery, that you shouldn't abuse children? How do we learn how to be moral? There are distinctive things about Christian morality. We could talk about that. But the truth is, there are core human values that are widely shared. And I think we can build on that. I think we can build on that. I'll try to be quick so that we can... Yeah. Can you speak to the issue of what the U.S. Constitution has to say about the, whether or not the U.S. is a Christian nation? So, outside my area of expertise, I'm not a constitutional lawyer. My understanding is that the Constitution gives two things, right? It has a clause that gives us freedom from religion and a clause that gives us freedom for religion. And I think both of those things are important. The Constitution does not talk about the Bible. It doesn't talk about God. Um, but it does protect religious liberty, and it also says you can't establish religion right at the level of the government. I do know there's a legal argument about states establishing religion and the Constitution forbidding that by implication, but I'm way past anything you need to listen to me about on, on that. Actually, I've been asked to make a quick announcement. We are taking up a free will offering that um, hopefully you will give generously to. This will allow uh, Lancaster and her church peace witness to be able to do more of these kinds of programs. So we would appreciate any help you can give. Okay. 
How can congregations and faith leaders take a public stance against white Christian nationalism? So that, I teach pastors. Pastors have it hard right now, um, and especially in white churches, because traditionally they've been able to speak to social issues as issues and not as partisan signs of loyalty right? And so you could trust a pastor that a pastor wasn't for your party or against your party, but was doing the best they could with issues. And now we have a situation where lay people in churches expect pastors to be loyal to their political group. And it's, it's creating an almost untenable position for many pastors. If you're a pastor, you're called to love everybody who's there, regardless of whether you agree with them or not. And at the same time, this is a time that calls for courage. What are some things pastors could say? The church should never seek its own privilege over other people in society. Pastors can say that. The church should always be looking out for the most vulnerable in society. Pastors can say that. Pastors, white pastors, can name the complicity of the church historically and now with racism, which takes enormous courage. One scholar I admire is named Charles Marsh. Um, he has the only academic job I would commit a crime to, a, to get. He, he directs the Center for Live Theology at the University of Virginia. And I've known him since I was a kid. Um, his dad was a white pastor in southern Mississippi in 1964 during the, the voting rights summer. And he wrote a book about his dad's ministry, which isn't glowing. I doubt there was a white pastor in Mississippi. I can think of one who, that I know of whose record was glowing in 1964. And since he wrote that book, I actually got to have dinner with him and his dad. <laughs> but that kind of courage is rare. The one thing I will say is, when we speak about issues like racism in the church and in our society, when we speak about um, freedom being about service rather than privilege, we, we can be way more effective in speaking the language of love than the anger I feel that comes out way too quickly. People need to know pastors love them. And so there are ways to speak the truth in love, but it is, I don't want to pretend that I'm called to that ministry. I'm not, and there are probably good reasons for it. What role does the theology of glory as opposed to a theology of the cross play in Christian nationalism? That's a great question, and I think I know what it means. Um, so we could take this theology of glory versus theology of the cross thing and put it in diff different parts of our theology because they are both part of a Christian theology, right? But what I will say is, when you hear Christian nationalist preachers, you will not hear them talking about the things Jesus did and the things Jesus said. You won't. You will see them talking about Jesus on the cross as a symbol. And you'll see them talking about Jesus the king with a crown, domination. But feeding crowds, uh, calling people to, to become as if they were enslaved to one another and not dominate other, over one another. I mean, I think Jesus said that pretty often, right? You won't hear it. Pay attention to whether preachers, every once in a while I've said to a pastor or student, um, you act like all Jesus had to do was die. So listen for that. A 
I live in a life care community and I'm faced daily with people who feel they are privileged, who feel Trump is great because of Christian nationalism. How can I influence them in a positive way? <laughs> to look, uh, to, to look, well, I'm not quite sure I, I'm reading Aren't this we out of time? <laughs> <laughs> um, so, this is the truth. How often have you ever won an argument? It's extremely rare to change someone's mind in a conversation. What can you do? I understand Jesus differently. I don't think Jesus wants us to dominate other people and take control of the society. I think Jesus had a lot to say about the rich man in Lazarus and the good Samaritan and the laborers in the vineyard. And I think Jesus had a lot to say uh, about healing and reconciliation and service. And that's how I understand Jesus. And I'm just not hearing that in what, what, what you're saying. Now, that, if you can do that, you can do it without arguing. But what you just did was they rarely hear it. Will they change their minds? I doubt it. I really doubt it. Um, but that is how we change our minds. We change our minds in relationships where we hear things we hadn't heard before. Right? Why and how is the military involved with Christian nationalism? So, I should just start by saying, I don't totally know. I know we have a problem with Christian nationalism in police and in law enforcement. I don't know how widespread it is. Um, I know that that problem has been documented from time to time. I should stop. Um, because I don't know how widespread it is. What I do know is, you know, reporting is coming out that key leaders in the military showed enormous courage before and around January 6, 2021. But that doesn't mean it was easy for them. When the problem is so urgent, and when we really don't have time to be patient to affect gradual changing of hearts and minds, we can't afford to wait for the misinformation and false narrative to die down. How do we rally to save democracy without becoming the aggressors? I, thank you. I, I honestly like what I tried to say earlier. It is really important to stay close to your spiritual core, to stay close to God. There's no substitute for that. It's also, it is a situation in which winning needs to happen. And even if you win one election or two elections, what you need to know is Christian nationalists have been at this for 80, 90 years. This is just the crest of a movement. And so we don't get, I hate to say it, we might get to breathe, but we don't get to quit. If we can remember that what we are working for, you notice I don't say fighting for. What we are working for is human flourishing, for inclusion, for everyone having a place and a role in this society. So I actually made up a t-shirt and gave one to a friend. It just says inclusive democracy. <laughs> you know? What, what you're talking about and what you're naming is, I want to live in society where everyone counts, everyone is valued, everyone receives the basic goods of that society. That's the society I want to live in. And you keep saying it, and you keep doing it, and you show up, and you organize, and you give money. There's no way around it, but don't let yourself become bitter. I think I know the answer to this based on everything else that's been asked so, asked so far, but when, if ever, should withdrawal, like the Amish, be an appropriate strategy? Well, right, you're not, you're, you're not called to, 
to be abused, generally speaking, right? Um, there are times. And um, I'm thinking of someone that I love very much who always thinks teasing me about being a liberal is funny. And one time I was at a party, I just looked, I said, look, I don't have any time for that right now. I really don't. I don't want to hear it. And they were kind of hurt, and they kind of went away. And they came back. <laughs> and I said, look, I love you. These are some great things about you that I love. But our society is under threat, and this isn't funny to me, and I'm not here for it. And I'll tell you something else. My dad has called me twice since January 6, 2021. Why is there so little pushback from opposition media outlets? So I, I think I know enough to say something about that. Reporters are trained to do a lot of things, but one thing they're trained to do is so-and-so says this, so-and-so says that. And the problem with... I, I really am going to say something that I think is true but might be offensive to someone. I don't mean to be offensive ever on purpose. Evangelical subculture in the United States has been built on dishonesty from the start. If you're in that culture, you've had tracts handed to you. Look, I am an insider. I was a Southern Baptist home missionary. I know what I'm talking about. About science, about schools, about history. And what reporters are trained to do is so-and-so says this, so-and-so says that. It was a big thing. If you paid close attention when reporters started saying, so-and-so says this, so-and-so says that, and this is not true. And then some reporter said, so-and-so says this, so-and-so says this, and this is a lie. But as soon as they do that, it hurts them doing their job. So there are other things wrong with reporting, but one thing that's wrong is they don't want to editorialize, but what do you do as a reporter when somebody just lies? And I'm not talking about an individual. So we have an enormous problem. And the other is, right, in the news media that Christian nationalists hear, they are told not to listen to anything else. Right? So when Donald Trump ran for president, he immediately said, the media, those people over there, at his rallies, right, those are bad people. I'm just going to make a comment because I'm old enough to remember when uh, the fairness doctrine went down and uh, things probably wouldn't be quite so bad in the media these days if that hadn't happened. Um, okay, what would make a white Christian nationalist change their perspective? What keys to help for co helpful conversation would you suggest? I, I think I spoke to that a little earlier a um, by, by suggesting... If, if you're from one of those church traditions that has the tradition of testimony, don't argue, testify. This is what I believe. These are the experiences I have. I love these people. That's not my experience of that. Now, I will tell you, most people in that white Christian nationalist world won't know how to respond to that because it's, you're not arguing back at them. But you're also not winning an argument. Just give it up. You're not. Okay, because the subject of education is, has been um, something that has been of great interest. Um, actually, I'm going to ask the first question, then the other ones have to do with E-Town. But one is, are Lancaster Catholic and Lancaster Mennonite among the white nationalist schools? To my knowledge, no. Boy, I should not. I shouldn't even answer. I don't have any reason to think so. No. Okay. Now, um, I'm going to conflate these two. Um, can you expand on 
the E-Town School District wanting to stop teaching science? Is it to stop completely or just certain topics? And what advice can you offer to E-Town residents who fear attempts to change this curriculum? Either I misspoke or I was misunderstood. Okay. That hasn't happened. There are members of the school right. board who want the curriculum just to be reading, writing, and counting, right. right? But they are not the majority of the school board. And the question is, so if you're in E-Town, there, and I should, um, I should remember the name of the organization. There is an organization that is rallying. Common Sense, E-Town Common Sense. Just Common Sense. Um, but again, it is a, a local election matters a local election matters that that is one um hemphill so when the controversy happened about transgender athletes uh the hemphill school board went to a christian nationalist law firm in harrisburg to get counsel on how to respond to that issue This is a really interesting question. Should people of color be Christians? <laughs> it's not that I'm going to decline the question. It's not mine to answer the question. Folks are in the room who are Christian. <laughs> Thank you. If that's preferred to say, I'm a disciple, Pastor Bailey said. Jesus wasn't white. <laughs> <laughs> well... Thank you. Do I acknowledge that was my husband? <laughs> Thank you. I think the, the, most of the other questions here are sort of variations on the questions already asked, but there is um, one more question here that I, I think, oh, I need to find it now. What did I do with it? Here and now in Lancaster, what is the most timely action to do right now? I, I, I've said a bunch of times I don't like being partisan in a church space. Even though I'm a member of a political party that by now is obvious, that doesn't mean I'm always loyal or that I think it's the greatest thing or I don't have... Organize. You've got two months. Two and a half months. Show up, help people show up, drive people, check to see if they're registered. Um, if you think you don't want them registered, don't keep them from being registered, just don't encourage them too much. <laughs> because voting is a right and not a privilege, right? But if in your life you haven't ever been an activist, you got two months right now in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. And that much is at stake. Let me explain exactly why. One of my issues is the interface of racism and public school funding in Pennsylvania, which were kind of national leaders. When I moved here from South Carolina, the first thing that struck me was, wow, it's more segregated here in Pennsylvania than there. What Doug Mastriano has proposed is to eliminate property taxes in Pennsylvania. So he presents it as a taxation issue. Nobody likes paying tax. How do we fund public schools in Pennsylvania? So if you break taxation revenue, you break public education. Just break it. The number one predictor of whether a child goes to an overfunded or an underfunded school district in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania is the racial composition of that school district. And if you see a graph of it, it will take your breath away. More than wealth. So, I'm sorry to say, maybe you want to hear a different answer, it's not changing your friend's mind. It is activating voters and voting. 
and we can sort out our party problems later. And I want to say, I know a bunch of wonderful Republicans who are courageous and activated about this. Love them. <laughs> Love them. Okay, well, that, that completes the question uh, portion of this. And I'm going to take the privilege of the one holding the mic at the moment to just speak a little bit more on the whole issue of voting because this is one of the things I do is try to educate people. First, the Supreme Court in Pennsylvania just upheld the law that allows for mail-in voting. So this continues. Unless the legislature repeals it, you're still good on that. I want to say that congregations can be active around the political system, just not partisan. Now we see some of our, some other congregations that are doing some of that, similar to what happened in Harrisburg with the congregation that hosted Doug Mastriano. That is not something we should be doing, but we can hold candidate forums as long as we invite everyone. We can do voter registration drives. We can organize to get people to the polls. We just can't um, say that we'll only take you if you vote the way that we want you to vote. There are a lot of things, and congregations have been afraid to do a lot of this kind of stuff to help educate themselves uh, because there, there's fear of doing something wrong. And, and it would be very hard unless you're only catering to one candidate or party to do that. As long as you stick to the things that I just mentioned, um, you're golden. So anyway, again, Greg, thank you. Thank you all. And Do you want to say a few words? Do you want to say a few words? I just want to let everyone know that our next event that LIPW is planning at this point is on Sunday afternoon, October the 23rd, when we expect to have uh, Professor Van Goss from FNM College talking about his work um, on uh, black abolitionist uh, work that was being done um, in this country um, before the Civil War. He's, um, he's a historian that's done some significant work on that, and we will have him on Sunday, October the 23rd, to talk about that. Uh, that, uh, that again, is at 3 p.m., and that will be at Grandville, Grandview United Methodist Church in Lancaster. So you will see more information about that if you're on our mailing list, uh, but I wanted to let you know about that right now. Uh, Pat, anything else? I'm sorry. Uh, black, we'll be talking about black abolition. Uh, Van Go Professor Van Goss from FN. I can talk to you about it afterwards. Uh, so feel free to, to leave. Thank you for coming. I think Greg may be in the back a little bit if anyone wants to talk to him further. So again, thank you for being here. And one more reminder, October 6th in Harrisburg, if you're looking for information, go to um, it's uh, pachurchesadvocacy.org. There's a, a on the calendar. <laughs>